I'm Nick Sider. I'm a field crop entomologist at the University of Illinois. And in this presentation, we'll be going over scouting and identification of corn insects in the North Central US. So just to point out in this presentation, I'm really going to focus in on identification and scouting methods. If you are interested in economic thresholds in particular, that information may vary from state to state. So I would encourage you to look up the information from your own state extension program as far as the economic threshold for your area. Um, and I'll try to provide some background information within the PowerPoint, within the presentation. Uh, but with that, let's get started. And I'm going to go sort of in order of the growing season. So we start with a number of seedling pests. These are insects that in some cases are feeding on the corn plant as soon as that seed is planted and germinated. Uh, and that scouting window for these pests uh, is really from planting on up to around V5. One key environmental factor that can influence this is the temperature. And what we find is when we have cool temperatures, during and shortly after planting, uh, while that seed is germinating, if it slows down the development of that seed, that actually extends the window of time that that plant is vulnerable to damage from these insects. So when we get into those cool temperatures, uh, just prior to or just after planting, that's where we have to be especially vigilant for these insects. Now, the first of these I'll discuss are wireworms. And wireworms are larvae of the click beetle. You can see a click beetle over here to your right. Um, you can see, I think, from the picture, the reason they call this a wireworm. Uh, this is somewhat of a stiff beetle larva, um, has a hardened exoskeleton, this yellowish to, to orange to straw colored um, coloration. One thing that's a little bit unique about wireworms compared with a lot of the pests that we look at in corn is they actually go through a generation that in many cases, for many species, there are several species of these that damage corn, but that life cycle will go over several years. And as a consequence of that, in many cases, you will get fields that are a problem field for wireworms. So if you have wireworms in a given field in a given year, you're likely to have that problem again in subsequent years as those wireworms go through their life cycle. Now, wireworms feed on a variety of different vegetative tissues, but in corn, they actually really like to feed on that growing point and, and on that germinating seed as it's coming up. This can cause stunting and this can cause direct stand loss, killing of the, the plant. And while this issue is uncommon, it can be fairly serious in those problem fields where it occurs. In, in terms of scouting, you can either actually dig up the soil and sift through it and look through these, or what most people prefer to do is to create a bait station. Uh, that's a, a bait made of either germinating seeds or decomposing dough made out of flour or oats. Either way, that's going to release CO2, which is what's going to draw those larvae in um, and, and attract them and help to monitor for wireworms in your field. The second of these early season stand reducing pests that I want to focus on is the seed corn maggot. Uh, so the adult here is a, is a fly. It actually looks very similar to a house fly. It's a little bit smaller. You can see that on your right. And the larvae of flies are referred to as maggots. You can see one of these here uh, feeding on a corn seed. And in this case, when that corn seed's broken open, you can actually see that there are several of these larvae inside feeding on that tissue. And so these larvae do direct damage to that germinating seed and prevent it from successfully germinating. So they'll directly reduce stand by feeding on that seed. Where you get into issues with seed corn maggot, they're particularly attracted to volatiles that are released during tillage and especially during tillage of decomposing organic material. Uh, so we're talking about fields that have been planted within a week or two of a extensive tillage operation. 
especially if that tillage operation incorporated either livestock manure or green manure from a cover crop or from a forage or simply from a, a weedy field. And you can actually predict the periods when these flies are going to be active based on degree day accumulations. Uh, so they'll go through several generations per year, but it's that first generation uh, that we're worried about. And so you can predict the activity of those flies using a degree day model. And if that period overlaps with your planting and you're planting shortly after the tillage operation, and especially if that tillage operation incorporated some decaying organic matter and it's cool and the germination of those seedlings are delayed, that those are some of the risk factors that can increase the chances of having stand reduction issues from seed corn and there are a number of other uh, relatively minor um, pests that will feed at the, the seedling stage as well. A couple that I want to focus on now are caterpillars that will reduce stand shortly after this. So shortly after emergence up to again around B5 or the first few vegetative stages. And we're talking here about cutworms, primarily the black cutworm and the true army worm. In mo both cases, these are moths that are migratory. So they will be flying into most of the, the north central region from the south, from, from the southern states. And those moths will be attracted to different types of vegetation um, depending on the species. So in the case of the true armyworm, this true armyworm moth, as she's migrating in um, from the southern US, she wants to lay her egg masses on dense, grassy vegetation. So not necessarily a, a pure clean stand of corn, right? What she's going to be more attracted to are, for instance, wheat fields, uh, cereal rye fields, perhaps, or grassy weeds, uh, grassy ditch banks, that sort of thing. And that's really where those larvae want to feed. What happens occasionally is that initial food source gets taken away either through a herbicide application, if it's a cover crop or if it's weeds, um, or because the plant is drying down in the case of winter wheat, for instance. And when that plant goes away, those armyworm larvae will migrate away from it and potentially migrate into corn and, and cause damage to corn. You can see the appearance of these armyworm larvae. A few things to note here, there are several different species of armyworm. That's why we call this one the, the true armyworm. They can be difficult to distinguish. One is the timing. With, with true armyworm, we're especially concerned, again, during the early seedling stages. You can, in some cases, get damaged corn from later generations uh, of the armyworm. They'll actually strip the leaves in localized areas. Less common, but it does happen. A um, few things you want to key in on here. One is this net-like pattern on the head capsule. Two, if you look at the pro legs in here, these will actually have a dark band across the pro legs here. Um, and then in addition, you'll have this lighter colored band um, across the side of the body. And one thing to always keep in mind when we're talking about identification of caterpillars, color may or may not be important. Color has a tendency to vary quite a bit. Uh, but the patterns, um, the relationships between those colors, these alternating bands, for instance, or this dark band across the pro legs, that tends to be a little more consistent. So just keep that in the back of your mind as we talk about some of these other caterpillar pests. So that's the true armyworm. Uh, the second major caterpillar pest we deal with early in the season is cutworms. And in particular, the black cutworm, that's going to be the most damaging species of a complex of different cutworms. One thing to note with the cutworm moth, uh, they actually have this little dagger marking on the forewing that can help you to remember that that's a cutworm moth. The larva itself uh, is between gray to, to almost black, and it's going to have a bit of a sheen to it. Often these, these look like they've been greased. Uh, or something like that because the light sort of shines off of these larvae. So that can help you to distinguish uh, these insects. But what we really key in on in scouting for both of these is the damage. 
So we can scout for the moths using pheromone traps to determine when those moths are, are active. Um, and we can use this combined with degree days, especially in the case of black cutworms to determine when those larvae are going to be active. So in the case of the black cutworm, you can see this damage here, and you can see why these are referred to as cutworms. They'll actually cut that plant off at the base, or they're capable of cutting that plant off at the base. Now they don't do this until they've developed to the fourth instar, so until they've reached about half an inch in length. Uh, and this obviously, if you have enough of this, this is a threat to stand. Now, during the day, this cutworm larva has been uh, excised, removed from the soil. During the day, typically they will either burrow into the soil or into the crop residue. Most caterpillars are going to be nocturnal when they feed on corn um, to avoid birds and other predators. But often you'll see they'll actually drag this corn plant down into the soil with them. So that can be a cue that they're there. Um, but when you see this damage, you first identify the damage and then you try to dig up some of these cutworm larvae and confirm the species. Now with armyworms, the damage is a little bit different. They're actually going to feed on this leaf tissue sort of from the outside in. So beginning at the margins of the leaf, they'll work their way in. If the damage is severe enough, the population is high enough, they may trim this plant all the way down to the midrib and reduce span to that way. One thing to keep in mind with both of these caterpillar pests and with other caterpillars, feeding on the leaves in and of itself is going to be mostly cosmetic. It's when we start to see stand reduction, either because the plant has been killed uh, by cutting such as this or by eating this all the way to the base of the ground or stunting um, for those same reasons, that's where we see yield reduction actually occur from these insects. And black cutworm tends to be a little more apt to do that than armyworm. Most economic thresholds in most states are going to be a little bit lower for black cutworm. We're going to tolerate a little less of that kind of damage uh, than we do with the true armyworm. But one thing to keep in mind here, these and other caterpillar species uh, will also feed through that leaf. And this will often result in these repeated leaf holes called shot holes. Uh, European corn borer, uh, an insect we'll talk about in a few minutes, is notorious for doing this. Note that this damage in and of itself is going to be, again, largely cosmetic. But when you see a lot of this kind of damage, that can be a cue that you have a population in that field that you may need to watch to ensure that it doesn't turn into a damaging population later on as that plant reaches a more sensitive stage and as those uh, caterpillars increase in size. The next I want to, to briefly review bill bugs and stink bugs. And these are two very different insects in terms of their biology, uh, but the damage that they do, uh, especially early in the season, especially around that emergence time frame um, into the early vegetative stages can be quite similar in appearance. So with the bill bug, this is a weevil. Uh, can be difficult to find these. They'll very often be found as this bill bug is upside down on the plant. They actually burrow into the plant in the growing point with this snout. They have chewing mouth parts at the end of this snout. Uh, and that will result in these repeated holes, similar to the shot holing, but you note that this damage is actually sort of elongated. And if you have enough of this damage early enough, it will actually result in stumping them plants. Now typically we're only going to see bill bug damage in fields that were either planted into what used to be sod or a pasture, um, turf of some kind, or if we have a history of issues with yellow nut sedge in that field. Uh, another pest that tends not to be a problem in clean corn fields, right? There tends to be a reason that these bill bugs are in the area. With stink bugs, you can have damage that looks quite similar to this if they feed during the vegetative stages. So again, and with all of these, you can imagine what happens is they're feeding while that leaf is curled up and they leave that hole. And as that leaf opens up, uh, those they sort of unfold and just like a, a paper snowflake you might've played with when you were a, a kid, it sort of stretches that damage out and keeps that damage across there. 
With stink bugs, when they do this, you get this sort of elongated tearing sort of damage, as you see here. And again, that damage in and of itself to corn is cosmetic. That's not going to reduce yield. If you have stink bug feeding at the wrong time, however, you can lose yield. And in the North Central US in particular, where we worry about stink bugs, is when they feed, feed on that plant right as it's emerging from the ground. And this doesn't happen very often. Uh, typically there's some extenuating circumstance that resulted in a higher than average stink bug population in the field. Uh, but it can be fairly serious if you get that feeding as those plants are spiking, stunting the plants as you see here. Now, during the vegetative stages, it leaves this cosmetic damage here. No big deal. You see a little bit of that. We can see a little bit of that in just about every field every year in East Central Illinois where I'm at. Rarely enough to amount to anything. If you get enough feeding during early ear formation, these can deform ears. And in particular in the Southern United States, that can become an issue in, in cases. And as stink bugs seem to be getting more prevalent in the North Central US, that's something to watch out for. But again, something that doesn't happen very often. Now, the next insect complex I want to discuss are corn borers and particularly the European corn borer. And there tend to be multiple generations of European corn borer per year, per year uh, through most of the North Central US, like we have in most of Illinois, uh, you have two generations per year. But if you go further north, if you go on into Wisconsin and Minnesota and the Dakotas, for instance, uh, you may only have one generation per year. You go into the southern United States, you may have three or four or even five generations per year, depending on how far south you go. Um, BT crops in particular have been very effective for control of these insects and have reduced the populations pretty dramatically over a large area. But we still see issues with corn borers, and in particular, we'll see issues with corn borers in isolated pockets where you have uh, conventional or non-GMO or specialty corn that does not have that BT trait, and especially where you're growing that continuously in the same area year after year. That, that's where we tend to see some issues still with corn borers. So this is an insect, as the name suggests, the larvae actually bore into the corn plant, either into the stalk or into the shank of the ear. Uh, you see this larva has this kind of creamy white coloration and these rows of bumps uh, across the back of the body. One thing that's interesting about European corn borer, if you come across these larvae, they'll actually crawl backward. If you sort of poke at their head, you see kind of the, the darkened, flattened head caps are up here. They're actually capable of crawling backward and you can use that behavior to help identify them, help to especially distinguish them from some of the other caterpillars that will feed on corn ears. When we talk about scouting for European corn borer, uh, the most critical time for this scouting and the most critical damage from this tends to be during the early to mid reproductive stages. So from around BT um, on into the early vegetative or reproductive stages. And at that period, we're really scouting for the egg masses. So we can use pheromone traps to determine when the moths are active and use that to guide our egg mass sample. Now, if you're managing this insect with an insecticide, it's really critical to time that insecticide between the time those eggs have been laid and the time that those larvae actually enter into the plant. As you can imagine, once these larvae have entered into that corn plant, there's really nothing you can do from an insecticide standpoint to prevent that damage from corn borers. So scouting and the timing of scouting in particular are going to be critical uh, if you're in a situation where you're worried about European corn. And in terms of the damage, they weaken the stalks, they'll weaken the ear shanks and cause ear lodging. Severe damage from this insect can be quite devastating as you see here. Again, something that doesn't happen as often for us as it once did. Um, but certainly a concern, especially if you're in those situations where you've made built up a larger local population of European corn borers. 
Um, these can also be, as you might imagine, an introduction site for various pathogens, various stock rots that will further decrease the integrity of these plants, uh, as well as a, a situation that's going to reduce the uptake of water and nutrients into the plant um, and reduce seed fill that way. Uh, so really multiple mechanisms by which this insect can damage corn. In parts of the North Central US, and in particular, I'm talking about very Southern Illinois, parts of Missouri, parts of Kansas. Uh, historically, we've had problems with the Southwestern corn borer as well. And this is another species. The damage that it does is quite similar to the European corn borer. And actually the management is quite similar, uh, based heavily with Southwestern corn borer on pheromone trapping of the adult moths to find those insecticide applications if they're needed. Again, uh, various BT traits are quite effective for control of this insect. Now, throughout most of the North Central United States, corn rootworms are going to be the most important insect pest. Most of the time, most years in, in most parts of this region, this is the insect pest that we are the most concerned about. There's multiple different uh, methods of scouting that you can use for corn rootworm depending on your goal. So this is an insect that goes through one generation per year and the control, whether it's an insecticide or a BT crop, goes out at planting. Now, if you're trying to evaluate the effectiveness of your control or perhaps validate your decision not to apply a control, uh, you would want to scout for the damaging stage of this insect, which is the larvae. Um, to do this, you would either go out and look for the larvae directly by pulling up roots and floating those larvae in buckets of salt water. Um, that's one mechanism that you can use to do this. Probably a more effective mechanism to evaluate larval activity is to actually go out and evaluate the damage by digging up corn roots and quantifying that damage that's been done to the roots. And you want to do that really beginning around tasseling um, on into the mid to late reproductive stages. You don't want to go too late or that root starts to mature and decompose and it you're, you're performing more of an autopsy on the root at that point than, than really identifying the damage as it starts to break down. If you're scouting to determine your risk of damage the following year, you're going to, to then scout for the adults. Uh, really, through most of the region, this is going to be in July on into August. Of course, these could be a little bit later, the further north you go within the north central US. And to scout for those adults, uh, there's two different methods you can use. You can use whole plant counts in corn, uh, where you simply count the number of adults per plant on a number of plants per field. If you do this, you wanna concentrate your efforts at that ear zone. These adults are going to be feeding on the silks and the pollen, uh, primarily when they can get it. So that's where you'll find the highest concentration of these. You can also scout for corn rootworm adults the way I prefer to do it and the way a lot of people anymore prefer to do it is with yellow sticky cards placed either around the ear zone, so around the stalk just above the ear, or if you're scouting soybean like we have to do in East Central Illinois where we have a rotation resistant variant of the corn rootworm on posts out in the soybean field. Now, throughout most of the North Central United States, Corn rootworm is going to be a problem primarily in continuous corn, primarily in corn grown after corn. That's where we tend to see the highest populations. And in recent years, that's really where the, the issues have been concentrated. But there are rotation resistant populations of corn rootworm in different parts of the North Central United States, including East Central Illinois, where I'm based out. So there's two species of corn rootworm that we are really concerned with. That's the western and the northern corn rootworm. Uh, the larvae look essentially the same. Uh, you can see they're quite small, uh, size of a head of a pin uh, when they first hatch. Uh, when they're visible to us down in the soil, they get up to be you know, right around half an inch, uh, maybe a little greater than that. You'll note they have this darkened pad at the end of the body and a darkened head capsule. That's a good way to distinguish these from some of the other larvae or um, beetle larvae or fly larvae uh, that you may find uh, scurrying about in the soil. 
And these larvae are going to feed on corn roots and ultimately that feeding will cause pruning as you can see here. Uh, they're actually essentially cutting off that, that leaf area um, and leaving only sort of a stunt. And to quantify that root feeding damage, you actually quantify the, the number of roots that have been pruned within an inch and a half of the, the soil line. Uh, above ground, if you have enough of this feeding and you have enough of a wind to knock that plant over, you'll see this, what we call gooseneck lodging. So that plant falls over and then rights itself and it gets this little crook in the plant. Um, or it may fall all the way to the ground, as you've seen here, and not, not pop back up. And we're worried about the yield loss, certainly from just a loss of effective root tissue, but this lodging can be particularly devastating, uh, can make the harvest difficult, if not impossible, depending on how much of that occurs. Very, a seri very serious issue when this happens. And again, you want to evaluate the impact of this in mid to late, July, um, essentially, uh, at some time after tasseling um, and before about our Now, when we're looking at the adults, and again, these are what we want to scout to make our decision following year. Uh, the Western corn rootworm is the more widespread uh, of our damaging species. This is the more economically important species in corn. Uh, you see these have yellow and black elytra. Uh, these black markings may be stripes, as you can perhaps see here, uh, sort of poorly defined stripes typically, or it may be sort of a black smudge <laughs> along the, the back of the larva here, or the adult here. Um, one thing you want to note, the body of the western corn rootworm, the venter as we call it down here, is usually sort of a yellow or a greenish coloration. It's actually somewhat translucent, and that's going to help to distinguish it from the striped cucumber beetle, which I'll show you in a bit. When we look at the northern corn rootworm, uh, it's going to be fairly easy to identify. They tend to be green, um, both their elytra and what we call the, the pronotum up here. They may be more of a tan or even a brown coloration, as you can see in the, the picture on the left. Uh, in terms of the damage they do, very similar. One slight difference with northern corn rootworm, they do get around a little bit more when it comes to their food sources. And you'll find these in many cases in giant ragweed and in other weeds uh, feeding on that pollen. And actually these adults can become a pretty serious pest of cut flower operations because they like to feed on a variety of different flowers as well. Now, a number of other uh, species that are very similar in this family that you see. One, you can see down here sort of burrowed into a pumpkin plant and you can see over here. It's what's called the spotted cucumber beetle, also known as the southern corn rootworm. This can also be a pest of corn, although it's quite a minor pest of corn. You can see relatively easy to distinguish from a western corn rootworm that you have up here. Uh, these have spots instead of stripes. They have this little heart shape at the back of the pronotum here. The other one that's a little more difficult is the striped cucumber beetle. And you can see a striped cucumber beetle here, and in comparison with this western corn rootworm adult, those two look pretty similar. Two key differences here, one, the stripes on a striped cucumber beetle are going to be much more well-defined, um, which hopefully you can see in this example. There's a little more smudging um, of coloration between the stripes over here on the left on the western corn rootworm. The other big difference, the thing to key in on, is that the body of the striped cucumber beetle is going to be black. Um, it's going to be opaque. You're not going to see through it and have a yellow um, or greenish body as you do in the case of the western corn rootworm over here on the left. Now, uh, another series of pests that you want to be able to scout for are the ear feeding caterpillars. And in particular, in terms of identification, we're going to focus on the western bean cutworm and the corn earworm. One thing to keep in mind, the European corn borer that I spoke with about you already can also feed on ears, though that's not uh, where we're most concerned with those larvae. In terms of scouting for ear feeding caterpillars, uh, the way that you scout for western bean cutworm is going to be a little bit different um, than the way that you scout for the others. So with western bean cutworm, 
if we're in an area that has issues with that insect. And this is primarily going to be um, sort of in the Great Lakes region where we have sandier soils. So parts of Northern Illinois, Northern Indiana, Northern Ohio, and then especially in Michigan on up into Ontario is where we've seen a lot of issues with this, as well as in Nebraska, um, in, in parts of Nebraska. Uh, we've seen issues with this insect. And in the case of the western bean cutworm, we're going to be scouting again for the egg masses during the late whirl stages um, on into tasseling, depending on when that moth flight is occurring. Whereas with our other ear feeding caterpillars, uh, we're looking to identify the larvae in the ear around R2 to R4. And, and the reason for that, we go out there too late and find this damage from an ear feeding pest, we could probably make a pretty good guess as to what the culprit was, uh, but we aren't really going to know at this stage. It, it's not that easy to separate the damage from one of these pests uh, from the others. But we worry about Western bean cutworm especially because this is an insect where actually uh, management with an insecticide may be warranted in field corn, depending on your situation. There are economic thresholds available uh, where we scout primarily for the egg masses. Again, since this is an insect that's actually going to enter the ear, it's actually going to chew a little hole in, into the ear and feed on those kernels. Uh, once it's inside of that husk, there's nothing we can do. Um, if we need an insecticide for this insect, it has to go out actually while those larvae are out and active and feeding either on the leaf tissue or on the pollen that's collected at the leaf whorls, uh, which it will do for a few days, um, up to a week or so before it actually enters the ear. You can see the larva here. What we want to do to really time our scouting for those egg masses is use pheromone traps again to scout the adults. That will tell us when we need to go out and find these egg masses, which are primarily going to be on the undersides of the leaves. Um, and you'll see this, as you can see here, kind of these purple spots that appear in the eggs when this is getting ready to hatch. Um, one of the reasons we, we manage Western bean cutworm where we don't manage some of these other insects is that in addition to feeding on the tips of the ears, these will feed a little bit more on the sides of the ears. And it's been shown that damage from western bean cutworm can actually result in yield loss if you have enough of it. So if you're at that point, if you're at an economic threshold for this insect, uh, an insecticide may be warranted, but you need to scout for these egg masses to determine if you're at that point. Now, the corn earworm is a more widespread pest. It's particularly going to be more widespread in the southern part of the north central U.S. and actually the further south you go in the United States, the more of an issue you have with this. And these moths are going to be highly attracted to corn while it's silking. Uh, they really like to lay their eggs on those silks. That larva is going to hatch and pretty much immediately go down into the tip of that ear. These tend to limit their feeding a little bit more to the tips of the ear. The impact on yield from this insect tends to be minor to non-existent. We don't really see a lot of effect on yield from corn earworm feeding. Where we can see some effects from this insect is in terms of quality. Now, one way, one thing to keep in mind with corn earworm identification, the color varies quite a bit, and you can see some examples of that here. You can find examples of corn earworm larvae who are pink, uh, brown, green, yellow, uh, sort of orangish, does vary quite a bit. Typically, they will have this pattern of alternating light and dark stripes, as you can see here, although not always. Head capsule tends to be this sort of reddish coloration. Not always. The, the color does vary quite a bit. Uh, what you can use to help distinguish these are these little bumps, these tubercules that you can see here. And if you look in at those tubercules, they will actually be coated in a, a dense coat of hair. Uh, so that's one way that you can distinguish these from some of the other larvae that will feed on corn plants. 
another insect to learn to scout for. And this is going to be an issue, especially if it occurs around tasseling, and especially if it occurs around tasseling during a drought year, uh, where it can actually reduce pollination. Um, we've been seeing more of these in field corn in recent years. Uh, the effect of that on yield is a little bit unknown at this point, but there have been some instances where these occurred late and actually interfered with harvest operations. So certainly that can be a problem. When we talk about aphids, there's two species that will feed in corn. That's primarily the corn leaf aphid and the bird cherry oat aphid. Uh, you look for the aphids themselves, uh, there will be many of these, hundreds if not thousands, you're unlikely to find just one. Uh, they also leave behind a number of signs. One of these are these, these little white flecks here um, that are actually their shed skins. And then their excrement is a sugar water material, um, we call it honeydew. And you'll find that and that's what can actually um, interfere with some things on these plants. Now, typically, with aphids in corn, they're localized. Um, they're not widespread throughout the field. It's fairly uncommon to see these at levels where we need to spray them, but certainly to keep an eye on these later on in the season. Another pest that we see, uh, not an insect, but an arachnid is mites. Usually this is going to be later in the season that we might see these, but they're favored by drought conditions. So if you get into a situation where you have drought conditions, uh, that's going to be the time when you might consider looking out for mites, especially as we get more into the, the western part of this more central U.S. range out into Kansas and Nebraska in dryland production out there. We have two different species worried about. One, the, the two-spotted spider mite. In terms of what you'll see, of course, these mites are quite small. If you look with the hand lens, you may see the mites or perhaps their, their eggs. Uh, on the leaf itself, you'll see this webbing, uh, if you have very many of these, and then you see this stipling of the plant, uh, these alternating lightened spots where the chlorophyll has been drained away from areas on this plant. The other species that they deal with in corn, especially again in the western part of this range, is the banks grass mite. Um, similar in that it's uh, favored by drought conditions. Um, that's where we would potentially need to be on the lookout for this particular pest. And you can see an example here and in, in an example of a mite egg, which again is going to be visible under magnification. With that, I certainly do invite you to send any questions you may have. Um, thank you for your time. And again, I will make this PowerPoint available along with some additional information to help you in your scouting efforts. And happy scouting. Mm -hmm.